how is my LDV D90 or Maxus or MG Gloucester in some countries? How is my vehicle performing after three months of f fairly intense private ownership and about 3000 kilometers under the wheels? Well, today I'm going to talk to you about this, my friends. I'm Dimitri and this is MG Owners Australia and I'll be the voice behind the camera and behind this footage, which I decided to repurpose and kind of hit two birds with one stone. I wanted to talk to you about my most important kind of findings about LDV ownership in Australia and at the same time wanted to share some of the footage of me driving around so that you get a bit of a more of a feel of what does the driver feel like in the car what does it what does it look like basically what do you feel like from the interior what does the outlook also appears like when you look out of the you know uh, out of the car on the road so if this is your cup of tea please give the video a like the more people see it the more you know the more of us here in our little friendly club and and the merrier it all is so let's jump straight into this um, so I had the car for about three months now I've been using it fairly intensely for private purposes driving around here and there mostly in the city in Sydney not on the highway as much but a fair bit of driving was done on the highway as well that is just to give you a bit of an idea of what type of usage the car is experiencing it's definitely private usage not much loading up has been happening there was no there were no massive family drives up and down the coast but there were a few with four people in the car that's about it so first of all first and foremost I already acknowledged it in the earlier videos and this one is just a proof of the fact that it hasn't changed this opinion the vehicle at least not a diesel this is a petrol model it's a two-wheel drive it's not an all-wheel drive not a four-wheel drive model it's the cheaper one basically model of LDV D90 it offers a fairly low power output also please understand that it's a massive dirigible of a of a car it's a blimp of a car and it's it's rather big fuel consumption is sort of average towards towards large fuel consumption uh, the mass of the vehicle is rather high and the engine is not the most powerhousey of them all and you can feel it you can feel it especially when the car is still a bit cold and not super warmed up so you can actually hear the engine struggling a tiny bit uphill but it's nothing too critical it's nothing you don't feel debilitated you don't feel like oh my god like I, I seriously feel underpowered massively underpowered on the highway as well same picture if you maintain reasonable speed if you're not just trying to go I don't know vertically up the hill up a very very steep hill with super loaded car and expect the car to just eat up that hill you know for breakfast if you don't have those unrealistic expectations within this price category of the vehicle of this size as well uh, as a nine seater look I think you won't be massively disappointed but the power is on the low side so don't expect a massive power output now one thing that does bother me and people who have been following me for a long time and watched my videos about MGHS they know that my massive beef with MGHS was around the dual clutch transmission I had various complaints there here the transmission is luckily not dual clutch it's an old school six speed automatic transmission whatever the version whatever the manufacturer of that transmission is I'm never pretending to be a massive mechanical expert um, but in this particular case right on one hand it's much easier in operation say on the stop and go stop and go uh, situations as you are uphill going uphill and trying to approach street lights for example dual clutch transmission in all honesty I think struggles in those kind of scenarios that I found myself in this one doesn't this one is fine where it does maybe not struggle but bother me as a driver is when the car is going downhill when you're going downhill and when you simply when you let your set your, like take your foot off the brake so you don't keep your foot on the brake or on the brake and you simply let the car kind of naturally slow down or keep keep a reasonable speed uh, by engine resistance I don't know how to best explain it but you basically you are not braking with the you, your foot is not on the brake and you let the engine kind of gain the speed as natural speed as it as it goes right don't know how to best explain it well in that kind of scenario if you have LDVD90 try to try to test it for yourselves and let me know in the comments down below what your findings are like but if you just let the car roll basically down the hill and relying on the engine to kind of 
manage this descent, so to speak, I find the engine revving up unnecessarily instead of, so it shouldn't be struggling, it goes downhill, right? So its weight should be just helping it gain the speed naturally rather than the engine revs uh, having to pull all this mass along, so to speak. Um, so in that situation, I do see significant and unnecessarily revving up of the engine happening. And transmission essentially does not appear to be switching to the to the higher gears, to the gears that would make it make the car go smoother. It simply keeps the revs up because it probably is stuck somewhere there on the speed, the second or third speed, right? Rather than switching organically to fourth and fifth speed, if I'm explaining it right. So that's disappointing and sometimes it takes some nudging, it takes some almost hacks, I would say, to basically nudge the transmission into switching to a, to a gear that would allow for much smoother and lower revs of the engine for it to overcome this kind of unnecessary, no pun intended, hump because you're going downhill, if it makes any sense to you what I'm trying to describe. But that's the best kind of explanation that I can give you. It's very, very odd. It is a bit bothering me because you think the car is going downhill. The engine shouldn't be struggling. If nothing else, it should be easier for the engine to pick a different gear and kind of just lower the revs. But instead, we're seeing the opposite picture here. It's just, it just goes up. Very, very odd, sort of borderline unnerving kind of thing. Final point that was fairly clear from the very first impressions of the car, but now that I've used it for three months, uh, every day pretty much, the infotainment system, electronic system, I'm not even going to call it infotainment because there is nothing to info slash entertain me with, you know, other than the rudimentary radio built in, uh, is absolutely most horrible, most useless infotainment system that I've ever seen in a car of modern age that was manufactured in 21, 22 um, range of years. It is absolutely inexcusably horrendous specific example is uh, the fact that such a massive, nice looking, nice enough looking, I suppose, uh, infotainment screen that could be repurposed for something wonderful, right? Such as Google Maps, such as built-in navigation, such as something else. I don't know what else. Um, it is kind of wasted. There is this relatively nice logo of the car appearing on it purely aesthetically, right? But if I wanted a picture, uh, like a, just a framed picture in the car, I probably would have hung up, hung, up, hung one up myself. But in this case, you expect that, that screen to do something useful for you. And it doesn't, really. Because the only thing that I really use is the air conditioning, and air conditioning controls are all manual in this car, which I like, by the way. I like the manual uh, controls. They're much, much more accessible, much easier to reach as you're driving around. But... If you want to, for example, even connect your mobile via Bluetooth, it loses connectivity. Even if you flick the switch that says auto reconnect, it still doesn't reconnect. And then just recently I spent some time, I'm not even bothering to show it to you here in great detail, but I spent some time even trying to reconnect it, trying to find the setting where I can pair the phone again. Where can I pair it again with this uh, stupidly designed system? And I couldn't even find the spot. I just see that no device is connected. I can see the name of Bluetooth device that the car identifies itself as, and there is nothing else helpful happening here in this horribly, horrendously designed infotainment slash central electronics panel. I very much hope that LDV uh, and however else the Psych Motor brands these cars in the other parts of the world, such as MG Gloucester, such as uh, Psych Maxis, I hope they do something with this infotainment system. And I know it's just, it's very ironic because I was complaining a lot about subpar infotainment system of top of the range MGHS, but at least that system had some character. It had some color. It had some Bluetooth connectivity was certainly a lot more consistent. It wasn't disconnecting me to start with. And it had a very rudimentary 1950s probably designed uh, system of built-in navigation, built-in maps, even if you did not connect Google Maps or anything with it, it was usable. You could use it if you really, really wanted to. And here there is nothing. There is a bigger screen and nothing. I actually hear squeaking of the brakes 
as you start braking, when you slow down to a street light, for example, but you start hearing this annoying like a long squeaky brake as if the brake pads are already worn off. And that's only at 3000 kilometers, considering that the car was bought absolutely brand new. This is in my experience, happens for the very, very first time. No brand new car should already have completely worn out pads, considering that I also um, followed the, you know, the recommended first check with LDV Australia uh, at 1000 kilometers. I had my first service. It's not like the car hasn't even been looked at after the purchase. But at 3000 kilometers, I right now absolutely distinctly hear this annoying screechy brakes as if the brake pads are completely worn off and are ready to be replaced which is very very disappointing and again i don't know if it points out at the cheaper brake pads at just simply the fact that no one bothered to check them and you know i had already worn out brake pads to start with there um, no idea no idea and my next uh, prescribed service is at 5000 kilometers which is rapidly approaching i will be probably reporting on that experience soon enough to you guys but these are these are overall my kind of impressions on a not so positive elements which I, i'm sure majority of people researching these cars that's what you primarily want to hear about but other than that hopefully as the video has shown you in the background as i drive around in this car the drive itself is actually quite enjoyable when it doesn't come to this weird transmission revving up and not switching gears and kind of lowish end of power i suppose the wireless horrible connectivity of devices probably not non-existent almost in this car and the squeaky screeching brakes very early on in the life cycle of the ownership of this vehicle other than that i'm still a big fan of its size i'm still a big big fan of its turning circle it's a very modest very short turning circle considering how massive the car is it's much easier to turn it than it was on my four-door jku uh, golden eagle jeep for example which was a similarly sized car um, and yeah, overall I'm still quite happy in terms of how much space inside of the car I got for the family for this very modest amount of money, roughly pay, having paid about $35,000 Australian when I got it brand new, uh, plus additions of obviously uh, tinting, window tinting and um, weather shields and that kind of stuff. But other than that, I think it's a fairly decent car as long as you're considering a purchase of it still for the right purpose. For example, to transport a relatively large family around or to do some form of camping or other kind of stuff. That's probably the best deal for the car of this size that you can ever get, at least currently in about May, June of 2022 in Australia. Talk to me in the comments down below if you are an owner of LDV D90, Maxxis D90 or MG Gloucester, depending where you live. And what has your experience been like, especially if you're a private owner and if you're using the car every day rather than very, very, very occasionally. Thanks for tuning in today. Hopefully I'll talk to you next time. Bye for now.